And thank you for the organizers, thank you to Anna Maria for your pair of this invitation. Uh, I was very fortunate to, uh, to hear some of the, the presentations this morning. I think it creates a good basis on which to, uh, to further discussions. If I may, uh, just, to, just to briefly say that this, pres this presentation was based on a paper, uh, background paper for UNCTAD's Intergovernmental Group of Experts meeting on finance and development. UNCTAD is the uh, focal point for the follow-up of the SDGs and the finance and development, and that's what we had last November. I, I invite you to visit that site because it has a, a wealth of information, not just covering development banks, uh, but also about illicit flows, about taxation, a wider range of issues, uh, discussing how to finance the SDGs, essentially. We'll be having another meeting in, in November this year, so please follow. And of course, uh, I'd like to, the, the team at GDS essentially carry out that meeting uh, with the part role by, by Victor Elias, of course. And, uh, and so we, we very much look forward to that work. Just in hearing some of the presentations by way of getting this going, I thought uh, one, one point I would raise is, that was raised this morning by, by Victor was that change is happening. And my question would be, well, how is change happening, right? And I was very pleasant, one very small example on a micro level, it's already happening in this room. I was very surprised just in sitting over there that my neighbor next to me, uh, you know, can speak Chinese. You know, I'm sorry about that, but it's just maybe 20 or 30, 40 years ago, that would be impossible. And that speaks to uh, the kind of intermediation of the South by the North, essentially. And perhaps in a South-South context, so there's more connections between the South. Uh, and how did that happen? Well, it's because we both received scholarships by uh, the Chinese government. Although his was, I guess, believed by Taiwan, from what you tell me there. Uh, province of China, but nonetheless, uh, bodies, <laughs> governmental bodies of China. And, and that those financed us to go and learn uh, the language and to be able to, to interact with each other. Now, on a, on a larger scale, I would also point to my presentation takes a slightly different approach in the sense that what, what, what you've heard so far today is essentially a lot about what, we, what the international community should be doing. And that discussion should, is very important and should be going forward and needs to be going forward. Uh, but my presentation is, is, is not necessarily about uh, legislating what needs to be done, how can things be done, what needs to be done, but, but rather a focus on what is actually happening in the system and, and also focusing on the creation of new institutions, which creates a competitive aspect um, that, that could also drive change. And so um, I think that from the African context, it's important to know what that, that, that these changes that are happening in the international system, particularly related to new development banks, and the opportunities that may arise from that. So without further ado, so to get there, let me uh, just point here. Go down. Down. No, sir. So very quickly, the, the, uh, the narrative that uh, the background paper code takes is essentially that there's a little aid, additional aid that's being promised out of the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, the overall SDGs, uh, but at the same time, I think that that's pretty well known, that there are no new resources that are being promised, uh, but at the same time, the role of multilateral development banks, MDBs, uh, it is recognized as a very important tool to, to, to draw in or to leverage the private sector to, to fund SDGs, essentially. Um, and here, the, the focus, I would put the focus on wider infrastructure, energy being one of those, and very critical. But if you have energy, but you have no roads and no ports and no, no, no rail, how do you sell what, whatever you're producing, right? So I would, I would have a wider approach to the importance of, of broader infrastructure uh, towards, towards reaching uh, the goals. And then, finally, there. I mean, going just continuing with that, that the, the established multilateral development banks, such as the World Bank, the African Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and, and, and others, are finding ways to to ramp up their lending. Whether that's enough is a question that I put to you, and hopefully we can discuss. But at the same time, there are new and new multilateral development banks that are being just created, and it's probably too early to really judge them based on their on their operations thus far. For example, the the, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIB, was only been created for two years, just recently had its second anniversary in the last month. So it's really early, but at the same time, you know, what, 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 what are these new MDBs, what are these new development banks bringing to the discussion? Are they actually changing or are they the same? Are they the same as, as the ones that, that existed before? 
So we're talking about a little bit of experimentation. Uh, given that China has a, has a big role in, in both of the new multilateral development banks that have been created, um, it might it might help um, it might it might be informative to understand more of what happens in China China's own experience and its own institutional workings. And finally, uh, the main message is really that the balance of power is changing, the economic balance of power is changing, and that uh, hopefully my presentation will be convincing that that this is a substantive issue. And that uh, that the that the the, the uh, Jewish community needs to do more to up this game, essentially. So my presentation will be very much focused on the latter part, and uh, and I very much welcome your questions afterwards. There will be a lot of issues that I won't be able to cover, so so please I hope to leave time for for that discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, so just quickly on on what does the Addis Ababa Agenda Action Plan really talk about, right? And so I'll be focusing here on on just what they talk about in terms of the bridging the infrastructure gap. And the main outcome, to be honest, if you look through the document, is uh, an establishment of a global infrastructure forum to better coordinate, to meet, to align uh, with the initiatives that are, that are taking place in infrastructure. No, no new funds, per se. And that's needed. Better coordination, as we know, uh, is very much needed. But is that enough? And so just as an example, one of these initiatives that the World Bank has been, has been pursuing is this global infrastructure uh, facility, right? 84.4 million, which is a drop in buckets uh, nonetheless, but, but a, a, any bit of uh, resources counts. Uh, but it's 84.4 million by, the, by this, this facility, but you should know that the largest contributor is China uh, at 20 million, and others uh, as well, but again, yeah, China has, has been contributing, which speaks to China's efforts to work through the current institutions uh, to, to pursue what it thinks are important development issues. Uh, but at the same time, what we're seeing are, are new initiatives, perhaps the frustration with the lack of reform within the international institutions, such as the World Bank and the IMF, to have a greater voice uh, for developing countries and for China and other BRICS. Uh, so it, it's also pursuing other initiatives that are, that are outside the, the existing institutions. So as you know, over 70 years ago, Conference of Bretton Woods created uh, the, the, the Bretton Woods Institutions, World Bank and the IMF, back in 1944. Uh, some historical photos, some footage for you. Um, and then whether it would be adequate to compare those side by side with, with the opening of the new banks, such as the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank and the New Development Bank, or otherwise known as the BRICS Bank. And so this, uh, in, perhaps in the previous context, was, was, was the creation of those institutions was to deal with post-war reconstruction, stability. We thankfully do not have that same situation happening today, but nonetheless, we are facing serious challenges with the SDGs uh, of a similar, or if not even more daunting nature in the rest of the world. Uh, so whether or not these, these new institutions are up for the task, well, that's hopefully what I'll be presenting to you today, and hopefully you find it convincing. So very quickly, I thought uh, one aspect of this presentation is is comparing the new new development banks with those that are existing, but I should also point out that the new development banks uh, are also different from each other. They're not just clones of each other. Uh, there are slight differences, and it speaks to the experimentation, perhaps, that, that is happening. This has a pointer, right? Mm -hmm. okay. So, as you can see, I, I don't want to spend too much time because um, cause I, I do have a lot of slides as well. Uh, certainly. Yeah, but. Uh, and so just to quickly, uh, the official launches of the New Development Bank was in 2015, in July, and the AIB in January 2016. So they're very new, they have different headquarters in different parts of China. Governance structure is also very different in terms of the largest shareholders. With the uh, New Development Bank, it's equal among the BRICS countries, Brazil, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. And whereas in the AIB, China is the largest uh, stakeholder at 30%. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of international credit ratings, the NDB, the New Development Bank, uh, has received a AAA credit rating in China only. Uh, and, and it's already issued bonds to, 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 uh, to, to scale up its financing. Whereas AIB has received an international credit rating of AAA, meaning that it's able to access international bond markets, not just Chinese bond markets, and perhaps a, a wider pool of resources as well. Um, if you look at the total lending, uh, that's very low by you know if you compare it to the World Bank, for example. But that's that's just to show where it is today. It's also interesting to look at the number of total total number of projects 
uh, the, uh, with the AIB having double the amount. Uh, but given that the, the member countries are much smaller in the NDB at five, and the rules pretty much for now focus the work of, of the operations of the New Development Bank in those five countries, that all the projects currently for the New Development Bank are happening in the BRICS countries. Whereas in the AIB, it's a much a wider uh, stakeholder base. It has 84 members. It initially started with 57 when discussions first started. It's since expanded to 84. And uh, the projects have, taken, have occurred in 12 <coughs> countries. So again, this is initial beginnings, but, but that's, that's where it is today. And so I know there's lots of hype up there about these new banks, and I hope that this perhaps can just you know, uh, just insert some facts and some of what's actually happening. If you also met, notice that the target sectors have a particular focus with the, uh, the New Development Bank, particularly focused on renewable and, and, and uh, environmental sectors at 75% of their lending by value, going towards those kinds of projects. Whereas for the AIB, it's 100% focused on infrastructure, of which energy is 45%, transportation, uh, which is what I didn't include there with the lack of space, is 30%. Yeah. So again, you see that the focus on infrastructure, but different types of infrastructure. Uh, you'll see that, uh, just to move along quickly, that the amount of capital available to each bank is also different. Their, their headline number is 100 billion, uh, but in terms of subscribed capital, uh, the NDB only has half. You know, the actual, actual amount of money being paid into these banks, um, the, the last line, the, the AIB has roughly double, which means that it has greater lending capacity. But if you compare them, uh, just in terms of their paid-in capital, their paid-in capital, uh, the paid-in capital is a portion of subscribed capital, well then this is the same, which is 10%, as you'll see in this slide, uh, comparing those two banks with the other existing banks. Uh, multilateral development banks, and at, at, from that perspective, it's it's a decent start, and given that they're they have a higher share amount of paid in capital as a share of the overall subscribed. Uh, this, of course, is just showing proportions. Of course, the World Bank does a lot more lending on an annual basis, uh, and the other banks as well than than the current new banks. Given that the new banks just started, but this gives you a sense of uh, of one measure at least of how to compare. Um, their lending capabilities, which is which is a, a subject of, of great debate going forward. Another way to think about lending capacity is to look at the what, what is called gearing ratios or loan to equity ratios, and this really is the extent of loan operations that are being extended uh, for different projects for a given amount of shareholder capital. And in general, as you saw in the last one, uh, that oh, sorry, uh, the general that the gearing ratios are quite low. Uh, for many existing development banks, such as the World Bank and the African Development Bank and the Asian Development Bank, basically because these banks uh, have to go to the international capital markets uh, to uh, have to maintain AAA rating in order to go to the international capital markets for, to, to convince bond investors to, to buy their bonds. To do so, you have to have a relatively conservative approach to your lending because investors want to be reassured that if there's any problems with lending to particular projects, they will be made whole, that they will be paid back. And to do so, you need to keep some reserves to the side. And that, 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 that's understandable, but the question is whether more can be done with this gearing ratio to have a higher loan to, to equity gearing ratio. The bank's articles of agreement uh, talk about a, a ratio of one to one. Uh, that is being slowly adjusted to, to a ratio of five, so that for every um, one, one dollar of, of equity, it's allowed to loan up, loan five dollars uh, to certain projects. Whereas before, it was more or less one to one. Uh, but an issue really it, is how much capital is necessary to maintain a AAA credit rating in international market, international capital markets. Right? The multilateral development banks. There is no regulator uh, for these entities, and so this, given the predominant role of, of the World Bank has over, generally led to overly cautious financial policies. Uh, and, and so this, this speaks directly to, to, the, to how much finance can be put to the SDGs. Uh, and how much, what, what role would the multilateral development acts play in doing so, given, given their unique role in the international system, if not a leading role. So to go through this quickly, I, I don't want to uh, spend too much time on this, but this is the gearing ratios of a selected number of existing multilateral development banks. AFDB, African Development Bank, 
ADB, Asian Development Bank, CAF, I think we talked about some of these this morning, there's a Latin American Development Bank, EIB is a European Investment Bank, and finally the World Bank, the IBRD, which is their uh, commercial lending side. And you see that in general, the highest level of, of gearing ratio is five, which is done by the European Investment Bank, and the lowest one is the African Development Bank. Now, I don't have a lot of time to go through what determines these, uh, but perhaps one, one factor is, is where these banks are doing their lending. And given the, the riskiness of what, what international investors perceive as riskiness in Africa, then that may, may contribute to a relatively low leverage amount uh, for the African Development Bank, but higher one for the EIB because it's mainly lending into European countries, which are generally uh, less risky. Uh, and, but just to say that the general level is in the single low digits of how much these banks individually lend out given their how much equity capital that they have. Another way to present this, now again this is proportion, so it doesn't tell you the, the extent of lending that they do. The next one uh, hopefully uh, provides a broader picture and this one compares multilateral development banks with national development banks, NDBs. And so, so what you get here essentially is, is that not all banks are the same as you could have guessed, uh, but you do notice that, for example, uh, so what you have here uh, on the x-axis is the gearing ratio, Oops, sorry. the gearing ratio here on the x-axis, and the amount of outstanding loans in uh, 2016, right? And this gives you a sense of uh, how much leverage they are for the gearing ratio, but also how many loans they actually have outstanding and their extent of loan. And so you see at the, at the left corner, there's basically three groups of the banks that I've, that I've covered in this, in this study. Uh, as you saw in the last slide, the multilateral development banks, which are, which are in triangles, are mainly here at the low level. Uh, South Africa, uh, this is the, the development bank of South, South Africa, and this is um, IDC, which is the international, which is the industrial development corporation, also in South Africa, relatively low gearing ratios. At the medium level, the second circle in the middle, you have uh, national development banks such as Korea, uh, of Brazil, uh, of Japan, but also you have this one, which is of the, EI, of the EIB, which is the higher level, okay? And then the EIB, for example, does roughly has around 300 billion worth of outstanding loans uh, for a ratio of around five. And then you see China, which is up here. Uh, and, and you see the ratio is much higher at roughly 11, and doing a lending of one over a trillion uh, US dollars. Now you might think this is, oh, thank you. You might think this is, uh, I was told that I had half an hour, but okay. Uh, anyways, I can make it quick. Um, if you think it's just because China is large, that is, a pos that is a possibility. I know it's potentially on your mind, but you might also notice that India is on this graph, uh, India Exim Bank. And, 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 and if, if largeness was all it took to become, to have high lending, then, then you'd see higher ratio. You'd see something, you'd see India performing along the lines of China, for example, just as a comparison. Uh, so this speaks to the amount of uh, experimentation of these development banks with the amount of lending that they do. Now, now why is it that uh, China is able to do this? Is it just because the Chinese aren't superhuman? I, I hate to break it to you. Uh, and um, you know the CDB, the China Development Bank, which was the one that I featured on that graph, was bankrupt in the in the mid 1990s, right? And so how did it? Now it's the largest national development bank in the world uh, by assets, and it has it's uh, it's China the China's largest uh, foreign the bank that does the foreign investment and, and financing abroad. Um, like other developing countries, uh, the, the CDB is state owned and benefits from the country's high credit rating, as an just guarantee. That's not very much different, but at the same time, uh, the bonds that it issues are domestically, uh, are domestically purchased by state banks. And the state banks regard them, because, of the, because the, the, the bank is backed by the Chinese government, they're seen as risk-free uh, assets to gain returns uh, on their depositors' funds. And so that, that is an incentive for the state banks in China to purchase these, these bonds, and that allows, in turn, the CDB to have very long maturity rates and to lend very long and very large. And uh, also, I should mention the Chinese policymakers uh, have this uh, uh, way of, of, of telling their experience with, with this development bank, with their own national development banks, as an exploration. This is constantly comes up in their own dialogues. 
Um, the, the president of the AIB has himself talked about the need for a creative spirit in these new banks, uh, that, that they should neither clone nor copy uh, the World Bank or the AIB. And finally, but the question really is, the burning question is, can this kind of experimentation that's happening at the domestic level in China be moved up to the multilateral level? Right? They're not exactly the same animal. At a multilateral level, you have different stakeholders. It's a more complex game than, than dealing domestically. Uh, but certainly, the inclination of Chinese policymakers to try to experiment with finance uh, is, is, is very apparent. Um, one way of doing this is through what, what, the, what, the, what the AIB's uh, articles of agreement talk about the special fund mechanism. Uh, because of time, perhaps I won't go through this. It's a bit technical. But generally, the maximum amount ratio that, that, uh, that the AIB is allowed by its own articles is 2.5. Now that's, as you saw in the previous graph, it's not particularly high, it's, it's, it's very conservative actually. And that is generally uh, in order to maintain, uh, to also access international capital markets, but I'll get there. Um, so this article basically mentions that the bank operations uh, are two types, ordinary operations and special operations. Now, it, generally this has not been covered well in, in the news media or from analysis. Um, but that these two types of funds can, can contribute to the same project, right? Um, and that the, the rest of that particular article uh, makes a clear partition that whereas uh, if, if, if this special fund contributes to the same infrastructure project that the AIB is invested in, the risks are held separately. So if there's any losses, they do not affect loss to the equity of the bank, but, but rather affect the equity of the special funds. Now what does this all mean? This means that I, th I think, from what I gather, is that the bank is trying to access both international markets and domestic capital markets. So on one hand, it's trying to maintain this ratio, this conservative ratio, to, to be able to, to, to issue bonds on the international market, to raise money, to lend. But at the same time, it creates this conduit through the special funds mechanism uh, to scale up that investment uh, by also tapping indirectly domestic capital markets. Now. Um, so for example, the AIB plans to issue bonds later this year. Now, the AIB could directly issue bonds in the Chinese market like the, and the New Development Bank is doing. Uh, that's not a problem, but I think the, 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 the interesting part of this is that at the same time that this is all happening, and, and I'm sorry if it's a little bit quick, but, uh, hope, but maybe with some questions later we can clarify, uh, but at the same time that China has built a, a, a whole a swath of, of, of national, regional, and bilateral investment funds in equity financing. And, uh, and so these, this I hope to position in the greater context of the AIB within this, this overall architecture. Now these are the funds themselves, uh, and again, uh, I'll probably go through them very quickly, but the earliest one was created, what is the China African Development Fund, uh, 2007. It was initially created, I believe, with one billion, and over the years, uh, it's been its its target fund size has been increased to 10 billion, and this is very much directly related to China's China African uh, cooperation. Uh, I think it's at the FOCAC, the Forum for, Afri for China Africa Forum, and and so that has been increased. And these are essentially uh, sovereign wealth funds that China has created at a regional level. I think, and you'll see that the main investors of these funds. Are other are essentially Chinese entities, mainly the development banks, the national development banks, but also other entities such as SAFE, which is the State Administration for Foreign Exchange, uh, CIC, which I'll just mention is is one of China's sovereign wealth funds, the China Investment Corporation, and I think uh, if I'm not mistaken that this is one of the few countries that has actually created sovereign wealth funds on a regional ba uh, on a regional basis, and this overall the target fund size of these entities combined is about another $100 billion. Now, that isn't to say that all of that funding will be going to the AIB, but perhaps a portion of it will, which will allow it to scale up operations beyond what we would expect. Um, I'll maybe I'll just go through this quickly, just to say that it's not inconceivable at some point, I mean, these, these funds will be doing their own lending as well in equity, uh, but at the same time, it's not, really, given their ownership structure, it's, it, I mean, we don't want to think that because it's state-owned that they're all being coordinated by some central planner. But at the same time, we could expect a degree of coordination given their ownership structures. Uh, and especially as the AIB garners more experience in the projects 
in, uh, in different regions, which is the main bottleneck that's currently uh, stopping some of these investor investment projects going forward. <coughs> so just to give you very quickly, um, how does this, this project financing structure look like? You know, hopefully this is, this is a very simple, very basic visual, uh, and this was essentially hinted by, by Joseph Chuan of the People's Bank of China, which, is, which owns SAFE and, and, the, and, and the China Development Bank. So it has an important say in these things. So for example, the Silk Road Fund, which was purposely built for the Belt and Road Initiative, that Silk Road Fund and other public and private investors can make joint equity investments in, in a project initially. Uh, that's public and private, so not just Chinese uh, entities. This can be further helped by debt financing from the China Exim Bank, which could be further followed by further financing from the China Development Bank, and also CIC, which I just, as I just said, was one of their sovereign wealth funds. Uh, and then now with the AIB coming online, they can provide further initial debt and equity financing, or not possibly, but mostly debt financing. The BRICS Bank uh, is also a possibility in this regard. And this is where Joe stops, uh, Mr. S Mr. Joseph Chuan. But it's not hard to see where those investment vehicles that I just that I just pointed out to you where they might fit in. So one is they might join the Silk Road Fund and initially do equity investments. But as the special fund mechanisms, it could also funnel some of that perhaps through the AIB um, and, and and enhance that that, that bank capacity. So as you see here, uh, this, is a, this is a kind of a wall of Chinese funding, but perhaps this type of setup might be more attractive to private investors looking, uh, looking for a good return on, on an infrastructure. Private investors aren't generally uh, very keen to go into infrastructure, but with this type of uh, cornerstone investors, maybe they would be. Some policy considerations, I, as I mentioned that um, the, the changes to, new, to, to existing multilateral banks is very much welcome, uh, but it, whether it's enough to, to meet the, the SDGs is very much a question. Um, so my, this presentation thus far is very much focused on, on um, looking at the lending capacity of these new banks, and that this has often been done in the literature by is, is essentially superimposing the operational features of World Bank and others onto these new banks. But I think an important aspect is looking at the institutional background and their own experiences of China, which is the major investor in these new banks. We should also we should also remember that in the context of the Belt and Road, which was raised this morning, uh, we could talk about it more. Uh, the it's, the Chinese were very uh, very diligent to, to to separate the operations of the AIB from the Belt and Road, saying that they're not the same, and that the AIB has a wider scope beyond uh, the Belt and Road. Uh, particularly focused on concessional financing. Uh, but at the same time, they do have a large overlap given the focus in Asia, particularly, uh, and the Belt and Road will initially start in Asia. Uh, another question that I would put to you is, given the structure that I just showed you, and it's a form of blended finance, a blended finance between different state institutions, could this be China's answer to blended finance trends in ODA? But I think the major question is, China is certainly, and I hope I've conveyed this to you, is this willingness to, to not only in, invest, uh, it's, to boost its investment around the world in infrastructure particularly, but also to, to use new ideas to experiment with finance. And it was some kind of experimentation that we don't see, uh, that we haven't seen uh, from the international community, and what response will they have? Uh, perhaps one way, another way of thinking about this, and I just have two slides left, so I'll be wrapping up pretty quickly. Uh, is at the opening ceremony, the signing ceremony of the New Development Bank headquarters, then Finance Minister Lo Jiwei uh, highlighted five types of innovations that were needed to, in order to update multilateral development finance banking for the 21st century. First being innovative development thinking that supports South-South uh, sharing and as well as South-South countries of the South to pursue their own paths. Innovative business models, custom-tailored finance, technology and knowledge, innovative organizational structures that are fit for a purpose, that are flexible and efficient, innovative financing tools, and finally, uh, thinking about uh, innovative development practices and thinking about development as, as a dynamic process. Now, I don't know what, I don't know if you would agree, Victor, but that, you know, Ante could have written that. <laughs> and uh, that would fit in pretty quickly, but pretty well. But, I mean, I, what I've talked about basically covers all those types of innovations, but with a focus 
on innovative organizational structures. I hope that I made that argument to you convincingly, and innovative financing tools. And whether that leaves further opportunities for countries in Africa and other developing countries, well, that, that they at least should know that these things are happening, if, if not already knowing that, and, and the possibilities that that might afford in terms of thinking outside the box on what kind of development policies uh, these countries should be, should be implementing to, to, to achieve, achieve that structural transformation. Finally, one way, another way of thinking about this innovative business models or innovative development thinking is, of course, the Belt and Road Initiative. Right? And now, now I, I've already said that they're very much separate. The AIB wants to be, but wants to be considered as a separate standalone entity, and, cert and certainly is given its ownership structure. Uh, but at the same time, it, 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 it's, you know, it, it's uh, obvious that, that this Belt and Road Initiative is get garnering a lot of attention and going forward as well, and has a lot of overlap given its focus on infrastructure as well. Right? So, in terms of thinking about innovative, uh, Innovative policies. Well, just to compare, just to compare uh, very quickly, uh, the for example, the Belt and Road Initiative is very nebulous in a sense. It's not very well defined, but certainly it's unlike the WTO and the Trans-Pacific Partnership in that it's not it's not centered on agreed rules and protocols and very strict enforcement of those rules, which developing countries might uh, might feel a bit uh, unsure about, but also might enjoy that extra flexibility. It focuses rather on infrastructure development to enhance connectivity and boost trade and development as the driver of development, not just setting up an organization to enforce certain rules. Uh, of course, the BNR is, a, is essentially a diplomatic and political effort, requires a great deal of political coordination that perhaps we've never seen in the South before between these countries that historically have not had a lot of interaction with each other. This will take time. This is a very timely and, and difficult process. But it, at the heart of it, it, it is a South-South process, and it needs to be done. Um, this limitations of the WTO might be an opportunity for the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, as some might point out, that the WTO is perhaps not well suited for relation. It's well suited for relationships between developed countries, but perhaps less so between developing and developed countries. And in that regard, the Belt and Road might provide a more flexible path. Uh, for that's anchored in, in the real economy, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so I'll wrap up right there, and, and I thank you very much. Okay, quelques questions peut-être quand même, parce que c'était quand même assez intéressant. Yeah. Deux questions. Yes, thank you very much, I think. Um, I, I welcome very much the complementarity of your presentation and the formal presentation. And uh, in this framework of um, maybe how how uh, can be Africa miss the opportunity of uh, the transition to the to the renewable uh, energy uh, to make it um, happen uh, and maybe how to leverage uh, on the initiative to go and to, to reach the opportunity of how uh, what can be the outcome of the green economy the, the new. Uh, Green economy approach for Africa. So maybe um, let's say um, the weakness that could be raised from this this um, uh, lack maybe of of, uh, of a public and private partnership can be also maybe transformed as an opportunity on on pushing on how public and private can face this 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 problematic to go on innovative financing and innovative cooperation regionally and, uh, and, and maybe nationally. Uh, so my question is, uh, how, what is the framework within UNCTAD um, to leverage uh, this, this new uh, phase of cooperation or the new idea of linking finance, the very contemporary finance, because we're talking about IMF, what is the, the reason to create IMF? That is another, another question. But in the contemporary framework, what is the old play of UNCTA to leverage and to move forward? Uh, instead of creating maybe the lack uh, could be a, a new barrier for trade and the impact can be difficult if you miss this transition to the green economy. So it's a global, global approach and what, what's within UNCTA the, let's say the way to move forward in terms of international cooperation. I can take a couple questions, Zara, and okay. answer that. 
Thank you. Um, I, I, I will go just straight to the point. Uh, during your presentation, it looks like infrastructure and energy is given much uh, priority, I mean, financially. Uh, I, was, well, I was wondering what, uh, <coughs> how much priority do you think health is having into SDGs and financially? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Just also to come to the point quickly, uh, you mentioned briefly PPPs. To what extent are uh, all the um, PRI projects, for instance in Central Asia but also in Africa, a mix of PPPs and to what extent is the risk assessment done by the different Chinese development banks? Okay. Thank you for those questions. Uh, the first one, I think, uh, to get what, what Ankhad is doing, well, I think uh, one thing I should point out is much of the information I presented is publicly available. Uh, my question to you is, well, have, how come you haven't heard of it, right? Uh, so, I mean, obviously, the creation of these new banks uh, was, was, to be honest, very political in a sense, right? There was a big debate about who would, who would join. Britain uh, kind of crossed the line first in, in making it accept, acceptable for developed countries to also join. Uh, so I think that there is uh, an information aspect that is lacking out there. Much, much of the information I've also picked up in Chinese media as well. Uh, so I think Ankhet has an important informational role uh, to, to provide, to kind of create that bridge to help understand. Because obviously there's, there's reasons also why South-South uh, relationships have been slow to develop, given misunderstandings, cultural differences, Lack of, I mean, different priorities, and I think uh, that with with greater communication and forums such as these, we can hopefully break down some of those barriers. And uh, it, it's amazing to see sometimes when when the South the South is actually intermediated uh, by 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 the South rather than by the North. Uh, and so I think it has an important role to play in terms of information, sharing that information, what's happening, so that African countries and other countries are, are kept abreast, but also in terms of research. Uh, a lot of what the AIB doing, is doing uh, reflects what China has learned through its own experience, particularly on, on infrastructure as, as a core uh, to its overall development strategy, right? And its ability to, 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 to not just uh, build infrastructure, but to manage it and to maintain it and to repair it and upgrade it. Uh, essentially, if you can do that, you're on your way, I believe, to becoming a developed, developed country. If no developed country has, has, has uh, all developing countries have a relatively strong grasp over infrastructure sectors. Um, and that's no coincidence, I believe. Uh, so I think Ankhet has an important role to play in, in helping, again, the South-South relationships, particularly with China, uh, but also on the research front, given that uh, sometimes it's hard for, uh, for, for the Chinese, for example, to, to discuss some of the strategies that they used. Uh, to be very frank with you, some of the strategies might not be uh, uh, might not be promoted by the WTO, for example, but they might be very effective for, towards structural transformation. And so these sensitive conversations uh, are difficult to have, but nonetheless should be had, especially in a flourishing democracy. Uh, and and to go to the second question on health and SDGs, I think I think obviously that that's very important. And um, but at the same time. The problem with the SDGs is that it gives the impression that we should do all these things at the same time uh, across the whole country. And that, that would be great if we could, but I think that's a very tall order to do uh, for any country to, to, to implement reforms in agriculture, and infrastructure, all the infrastructure sectors, health, right? Uh, which isn't to say that some, some should be first or some should be latter. I think that's a bit of a, a false dichotomy. But certainly, yeah, speaking to the energy point, if you have a hospital that has no energy, then, then that's a white elephant, essentially. Uh, and so, again, it's a sequencing aspect. And, and this I wish I could spend a bit more time on, but certainly this, this is very prominent in China's own experience in, in focusing on productive sectors uh, so that you have the energy, you have the telecommunications, you have uh, the roads and the transportation uh, in order to make the use of the hospital functional. Uh, and of course, not to mention the doctors to actually house it. And you're not bringing in the doctors from outside, but hopefully you're training them also domestically. Uh, so I think it speaks to a wider approach on how the SDGs don't give you a strategy on how to accomplish these various 
these various uh, targets. And I think uh, that obviously requires a long conversation. Uh, but you might uh, take, you might be interested in the fact that in, uh, in China's development history or experience, it has not used the the the, the previous uh, uh, the previous version of the SDGs, the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. It did not use the MDGs as overarching development strategy. But in in developing what it thought was the right way and and basically pushing for structural transformation, it achieved the MDGs and beyond. Right? And I think that's what we should be focusing on. It's great to have to focus our minds, because we're not very focused sometimes, uh, and to focus on certain targets. But the SDGs do not provide a map or any kind of strategy on how to actually achieve it. And it's ironic that a country that didn't focus on these targets specifically was able to achieve them in spades. And again, I don't buy this that the Chinese are a superhero. Uh, but we can talk about that if we must. And finally, on the PPPs, uh, yes, I, I think. It's an interesting uh, dichotomy what's happening. The, the OECD countries are seemingly very interested in promoting uh, blended finance, bringing in the private sector. Uh, we know that there's lots of private sector uh, savings out there that are just being, you know, that are that are parked in, in treasuries and not willing to take the risk to invest in these areas. Uh, that has always been a problem with the PPPs, and I think now even in Britain, the debate about PPPs and, and how effective they actually are is being uh, questioned. Uh, and you know, we have the Financial Times has a special section on revisiting PPPs given their experiences in that country. Mm -hmm. I think it raises a lot of issues about that model. But certainly PPPs can be crafted uh, for different types of infrastructure. Some infrastructure is more profitable than others, such as telecom is very relatively profitable. Uh, investment in, in sanitation or water is very much less so. Uh, so I think Chinese are certainly experimenting with different forms of uh, these partnerships. Uh, maybe their uh, maybe their adaptation would be public-public partnerships, uh, PPPs, which are still PPPs, uh, <laughs> but a slightly different approach. And, but I think it's important because you know why did they create all these separate funds when they could just create one fund and then they could do all of it, right? And I think that's also a lesson from their own experience in that it's much easier to keep track of funds when they're se separate. And they have different eyes focusing on different pots of money, uh, and that way you can, you can have a, a greater accountability in that regard. Um, so I think, if I can also just, from that question, go to the question of profitability. When we talk about PPPs, the private sector it, um, expects a certain return, right? And that's, 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 not, that's not wrong, that's not okay. Uh, we all need a certain amount of return, but the question is, how much return is enough? Uh, you know, given that some of these investments are in infrastructure, right? The, the critical infrastructure to 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 improve the livelihoods of all people. And so, whether 20 percent, I mean, 20 percent is rough, roughly what the private sector expects, or something around there, double digits. Uh, and I think, uh, from what from what China is talking about, at least, well, I think it remains to be seen whether this is happening on the ground. But I think they're, they're much more uh, content with a lower level of profitability, but it must remain somewhat profi profitable. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, they can use that profit to recycle for further investments. That is at the heart of the China Development Bank model. They actually have a saying for this in Chinese. Uh, they call it uh, uh, guarding principle, marginal profit. Or protecting capital, or guarding your, you know, protecting your principle, marginal profits. And that doesn't sound very capitalistic to me, uh, because if, you know, in the in a very brute capitalistic way, you're not going for marginal profits; you're going for maximal profits, right? Uh, so this is a bit of a variation on that. Whether that proves more successful in in financing infrastructure, which is high cost, as we see, lots of infrastructure to be invested in, which long gestation periods, high risks in developing countries, that remains to be seen. Uh, but I think that this at least speaks to experimentation with different kinds of finance. Okay, thanks a lot.